started. So today we're going to talk about DC circuits. And especially those that have resistors in them. And we've already talked about this a little bit, but we're going to go in more detail now. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the EMF, which is an acronym for the electromotive force. But I will not say this word, like I won't call it this because this is a misnomer. Uh, EMF is not a force. So whoever named it uh, should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, and what the EMF is, is basically a, instead of a force, it's a voltage that pushes charge through a circuit. And how it's different from just a regular voltage is that if we look at this circuit diagram, here's our voltage source and here's our resistance. And in an ideal world, we can use our Ohm's law equation and if we know this resistance R and this voltage V, then we can find the current flowing through the circuit. So this is the ideal case. But in the real world, the voltage source has some small internal resistance. And we usually write that as a lowercase r. And so this cursive E is the EMF. So I might write it as E just like that or as EMF. And so basically the EMF takes into account the fact that whatever voltage source you have is gonna have some small but not negligible internal resistance. So EMF takes into account the small but not negligible internal resistance of the voltage source. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about how we treat this EMF. This is the real world. Okay. So how do we deal with this? So if we look at the free body diagram that we just, or not free body diagram, circuit diagram, 
and let's say the EMF of the battery is 10 volts. This resistance is 20 ohms. And this resistance is one. If we look at just these two resistors, are these in series or parallel? Uh, so these guys are going to be in series. So if you look at the path that the current can take, it can only flow in one path and it has to go through both of the resistors before it gets back to the battery or EMF source. So because these two resistors are in series, Then to get the total resistance, we just add the two resistances together. So the total resistance in this circuit is 20 plus one, so 21 ohms. And what that would do for your current, so now in our Ohm's law equation, we take our EMF, we divide it by the total resistance, and we would find how much current is flowing through our circuit. So if the EMF is 10, the total resistance is 21, then dividing those two will give us the current for 0 0.48 amps. So this is an example of if you knew what the internal resistance of the battery was. Typically, that's not something you know. And I'll show you now what we, what we, what the normal uh, course of events is. So normally, you have some voltage source Let's say you have a battery that claims that it has an output of two volts and you've hooked it up to some resistor that you know is five ohms. And you have placed you have placed an ammeter in your circuit and here you expect that the ammeter will read Two divided by five volts, or two two volts divided by five ohms, or zero point four amps. So this would be kind of your theoretical current. But in real life. 
your current reads 0 0.35 amps. And so now you are seeing that your, what current you expect is, the current that you measure is a little bit less than the current you expect. And so we're gonna attribute it to this small internal resistance. And we can figure out what this internal resistance is now. And the first thing that we can do, so we'll go back to this equation, but now instead of using R, we're gonna replace it with some total resistance that would include both of these Rs together. So R total is capital R plus little r. So if we solve this equation for R total, we get EMF over current, the EMF is two, the current is 0 0.35. And so if we uh, plug that into our calculator, we get 5.7 ohms. And so then to get the internal resistance, we would just take this equation, solve it for R, little r, 5.7 minus 5, or little r equals 0 0.7 ohms. So EMF is just a way to take into account the fact that your voltage source will have some internal resistance. And depending on how the problem is worded, you either, you might need to take that into account using this kind of a method that we've just described. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is what to do if there are multiple voltage sources in a circuit. So all of the circuits that we've seen so far have only had one voltage supply and then either resistors or capacitors in the circuit. But what happens if we have two voltage supplies? So maybe you have a system that looks like this. V1, R1, V2. And R2. And maybe I'll, I'll switch this one so it faces this one. 
And actually, I guess before I start that, uh, let's go more in depth with one. Uh, so we'll start off with an easy example. And this will help illustrate uh, one of the rules that we're gonna need for the other problem. So uh, we're gonna look at how the voltage changes as we go around a circuit. So, and we can just put some random numbers here. And we'll just assume that this voltage is a uh, ideal voltage. There's no EMF stuff that we need to worry about. Uh, because this is the positive terminal of the voltage supply and this is the negative, we would expect our current to flow in this direction. And we can calculate the value of that current using Ohm's law. And we would get 10 amps of current flowing through this circuit. So this is the current. We're saying that the voltage across this uh, power source is 10 volts. If we were to hook a voltmeter across this circuit or across this resistor, the change in voltage across this resistor has to equal negative IR, right? So we found the current flowing through this circuit or we were given the current flowing through this circuit. And we know that voltage equals IR. So there's a current flowing through this resistor. It has this resistance. So we know that the voltage across this resistor has to be this equation. And so if we calculated that voltage, it maybe isn't surprising that that would be 10 volts. And the negative sign is important. Yeah, so the, and this is comes to the rule that I wanted to introduce here. So as you go around a circuit, so as you go around either the whole circuit or a loop of the circuit, the total voltages have to add up to zero. So you might see this referred to as the loop rule. And so if we look at the uh, voltages in our circuit that we have up here, we have a voltage from our power supply. Then we have the, I guess you could write it as the voltage across the resistor. And when you add those two things together, you have to get zero. So because this is 10 from the power supply, then this voltage has to be negative 10 in order for this rule to be true. 
So that was an example for just one resistor. Now maybe I'll show you an example for two resistors and then we can go back to the initial problem that we had. Two resistors. So let's do it this way. So let's pretend that we don't know the how to find this current and we'll find it using the loop rule. So let's find current using loop rule. And so here's how we would do that. So you just write down all the voltages as you go around this resistor or the circuit and set them equal to zero. So the loop rule for this circuit, you have your voltage from your power supply. Then you have the voltage from resistor one and yeah, the voltage from resistor two or the voltage drop across resistor two. And adding up all those things, you have to get zero. Because this is one loop, the current flowing through each part of the circuit has to be the same. So when I want to write the voltage drop across resistor one, I so I, I put a minus sign just because I know that the voltage from this power supply is positive. So I need the other voltages to be negative so that when I add them together, it all adds up to zero. So that's where this negative sign is coming from. Oops. times R1. And then the voltage drop across resistor two is the current times R2. And so to go from this step to this step, I'm just using Ohm's law, right? So the voltage across resistor one is current times resistor one, and that's just Ohm's law. And then when I add all those up, I get zero. So if we look at, so this is a loop rule equation. If I look at this equation, how many unknowns are there? So there's just one, right? We don't know the current. We're given V1, we're given R1, and we're given R2. So we can solve this equation. So first I'm going to factor out the current. And then I can move the current and the resistance to the other side by just adding it. Then if I want to solve for current, I'll divide the resistance to the other side. And so I get current equals V1 over R1 plus R2. So the voltage uh, was 12. The 
resistance for resistor one was two. And then for resistor two, the resistance was four. And so we get 12 divided by six, which is two amps. So this is all mathematically equivalent to, so if you start with this circuit and let's just say instead, I wanted to combine the resistances into their equivalent resistance. The rule for equivalent resistance for a series circuit is you just add up your resistances And then if you wanted to calculate your current, you would divide the voltage by the equivalent resistance and you would get the same answer. So you might think that this equivalent resistance equation or calculation is easier and that's true, but it's only gonna work in cases of simple circuits with only one loop. As soon as we add other loops to our uh, circuit and other voltage sources, we're not gonna be able to do this. So uh, I just did it this loop rule way to give you a kind of the simplest example I could give of how to use the loop rule. So let's come back to this picture that I drew here. Maybe I'll throw in some numbers. Five volts one volt, two ohms and 10 ohms. Okay, so now this is a I guess I'm not sure what the right word for this kind of question is, but maybe a morphological question. Uh, but uh, I'll ask you guys first. So what, if you look at this circuit that I've drawn here, how many loops are there in this circuit? Okay, so there's some two. Uh, let me see if, what do people in the chat think? So some people also think too. Uh, so there are three loops in this circuit. So there's this loop. There's this loop. So those are the two loops that I'm assuming most people thought of, right? or maybe not. And then there's this third loop. So if we look at the blue loop, uh, so somebody's asking, so there are two inner loops, but the current can also flow around the outer loop. Uh, so we wanna count up all of the loops. And so what we're gonna do is take this, our loop rule equation that we saw and apply it to each of these three loops. Now, the direction that I go around the circuit uh, is arbitrary. I just, so basically you just guess and then you'll check your answer at the end. Uh, so 
I could have easily drawn this arrow this way, and it'll that still will be mathematically and physically valid. Uh, but you just need to pick one direction and stick with that throughout your whole problem. So we'll go with everything going clockwise. Um, so if we do our blue loop, we have our voltage supply. Then we have the voltage drop across resistor two. And I'll call this, I'll call this the current flowing through resistor two. And I'll rename these in a moment when we talk about a different concept. Times R2. And then, so we're going around the outer loop and we've gone through everything. And then we come back to the voltage supply one and we're at zero. All right, so we're starting here. We go across this voltage. So we write down V1. Then we go across this resistor R2. So we need to write down that voltage drop. And then we come back to where we started. So that's one loop. Then if we look at the red loop, again, we'll start going through V1. Now uh, we have some current flowing through R1 times R1, and that would be the voltage drop across R1. And now the battery V2. So as we're going across V2, if we're going clockwise, because we are going from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, the voltage will be negative. So if you look at when we go across V1, we went from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And so we recorded that voltage drop as positive or the difference in voltage is positive. But then when we go across this voltage, because we're going from positive to negative, we put it as negative. And then we get back to where we started. So we say that all of that has to be zero. And then the yellow loop. Uh, let's start at voltage V2. So that'll be positive because we're going from the negative to the positive terminal. Then we have the current flowing through R1 again. And then we go across resistor two. So we have the current flowing through resistor two minus or times the value of resistor two. So in this specific example, uh, if we look at these three equations, How many unknowns are there in these equations? Two, right? We don't know either, well, yeah. We don't know the current flowing through resistor one or resistor two. So we have two unknowns. But we have three equations. 
So we should be able to solve the system of equations. So these were the three equations that we got from the loop rule. If you look at the first two, you'll see that they're linearly independent. And so we can just directly solve for the current flowing through resistor two and resistor one respectively. So solving for the current flowing through resistor two, in the first equation, we get V1 divided by R2. The voltage from source one is five volts. The resistor two has a resistance of 10 ohms. So the current flowing through resistor two would be 0 0.5 amps. Doing the same uh, for the second equation, solving for the current flowing through resistor one, we get V1 minus V2 over R1. V1 was five, V2 was one, and R1 was two. So we get four minus two, which is two amps. So if we take those two currents and plug them into this third equation, we can check if uh, everything works out. So the voltage through source two was one volt. The current flowing through resistor one was two amps. The resistance of resistor one was two ohms. The current flowing through resistor two was 0 0.5 amps. And the resistor of resistor, the resistance of resistor two was 10 ohms. So we would get one minus four minus five, and that does not equal zero, right? That equals um, minus eight, which is obviously not zero but we wanted it to be zero. So what happened? So there is a way to combine all of these things such that they do add up to zero. And that would be by making the current flowing through resistor one. So we wanna make the current flowing through resistor one equal to negative two. If we did that, we would get one plus four minus five, which equals zero. So what this tells us is that this two amps should be negative. And if we look back at our circuit diagram, which looks something like this. We had guessed that the current flowing through the middle leg went down. But what we've just seen is that the correct current actually flows up through the center leg. And that's fine. Um, so you arbitrarily guess a direction for your current. Then you work the problem, which is gonna be a lot of algebra. And then at the end, you check if your guessed direction was correct. And if it's not, you just make a note 
about the correct direction. Let's just say it's the same picture for now. Uh, but instead of giving you all the voltages and resistances, I could instead give you the values of these currents. Um, I guess maybe this, this leg would need a resistor. So there I'm giving you three currents and Maybe I give you one of these resistances. So the things in blue are given to you. These would be given, and then the things in red would be your unknowns. So the loops that we had written down would be the same pretty much, uh, but we would have one more uh, resistance that we would need to include, and then the So we would still have three loops. So that would be three equations. Uh, but we have four unknowns. Uh, so we would need another equation. And that equation is going to come from uh, what's known as the node rule. And so a node is just anywhere that you have a junction in your circuit. So this is a node and this is a node. And what the node rule says is that whatever current is going into the node has to equal the current going out. So for the node that I drew up here, if you look at the direction of the arrows, I'm guessing that I1 is going into the node and that I2 and I3 are coming out of the node. And so together, the loop rule and the node rule are called Kirchhoff's, and I'm not sure if this is the right spelling, Kirchhoff's laws. So next class, I will work through an example of this kind of a problem uh, to show you how we would solve this system of equations.